Okay, hi everyone. My name is Roland Dobbins. I'm a principal engineer for the Arbor Division of NetScout, and uh, we're here to talk about a year like no other, uh, DDoS in a time of pandemic. And so uh, this, is, uh, this presentation is based on our sixth um, uh, biannual threat report, and you can go and download a copy of the threat report at any time. It's entirely free, uh, just registration required. So what have we seen uh, during the pandemic in terms of the DDoS threat landscape? Well, what we've seen is a tremendous uptick in the number of DDoS attacks. Um, we have seen um, a 20% increase year over year. Uh, we're seeing more than, we've seen more than 800,000 DDoS attacks a month for a total of uh, almost 10.1 million DDoS attacks um, after the pandemic kicked off. We saw uh, three and a half uh, new re UDP reflection amplification vectors added um, by the attackers, and I'll explain that in a minute. We also saw a very high profile DDoS extortion campaign, the LBA DDoS extortion campaign, where the attackers targeted 275 <coughs> different uh, organizations across 40 vertical markets and 55 countries, including several countries um, in Latin and South America. So let's take a look at uh, the regional summaries here in terms of the highest bandwidth and throughput DDoS attacks we observed directly. Um, the highest bandwidth uh, DDoS attack we observed directly was 1.12 terabits per second. The highest throughput attack was about 581 uh, million packets per second. And the average DDoS attack length was almost 40 minutes. Uh, and in, in May of 2020, we saw uh, 9.3, uh, 930,000 and excuse me, a DDoS attacks in that month. So the LPA DDoS extortion campaign, uh, this is a DDoS threat actor. Um, when the DDoS extortion landscape, we often see the threat actors will send the extortion email to their targets and will claim to be some well-known hacking group and encourage the targets to search for them, to try to scare them into paying. <clears throat> and since this group called themselves Lazarus Group, Fancy Bear, and sometimes Armada Collective, um, we decided to call them the Lazarus Bear Armada, or LBA. This, um, this very high profile DDoS attack campaign began in August of 2020. Um, and at first the attackers were going after mainly targets in the financial industry, banks and currency exchanges and credit card processors and so forth. Over time, the attacker moved to other vertical markets like insurance companies, broadband access ISPs, the hospitality industry, um, and they even um, decided to, in some cases, be extremely persistent and go after the, up, the upstream transit ISPs of their targets, and sometimes even DDoS mitigation service providers providing DDoS defenses for the targeted organizations. They used different combinations of DDoS attack vectors up to 14 different vectors. Uh, we were able to see this uh, across the track of the camp, the, the, the course of the campaign. Uh, they would target the VPN concentrators at their targets so that those organizations couldn't have their uh, security team respond effectively and also disrupt their remote workforce who are working remotely during the, uh, during the pandemic. Um, this uh, threat actor did a lot of pre-attack reconnaissance to determine the best way to disrupt the service delivery chain of the targeted organization. Now, they didn't use any exotic or new DDoS attack techniques. They used DDoS attack techniques that, that we're very familiar with. We believe that they were using uh, a booter stressor service, a DDoS for higher service uh, to launch these attacks. And so if we take a look um, uh, after the campaign kicked off over time, um, we actually um, saw that the attacker would attack in clusters in different regions of the world. And this attacker would actually shift their time zone to match the, the time zone of the business day of the uh, country in which their targets were located. And so they would target um, a number of organizations organizations in the same region in the same country and then move on to another one and another one and another one. 
And they started off, uh, as I noted, with the financial industry, and they switched to these other verticals over time, but they always kept coming back uh, to financial organizations throughout the entirety of the DDoS attack campaign. And uh, we were able to develop um, a fingerprint for this attacker by observing the, their DDoS attacks over time. We were directly involved in helping uh, a lot, uh, several network operators successfully mitigate these DDoS attacks. And that plus our uh, visibility into DDoS attacks globally allowed us to develop this fingerprint. And so we were able to actually track this entire DDoS attack campaign throughout its entirety globally. This is something that has never been done before. Uh, for a specific DDoS attack campaign and threat actor. And of course, we see that uh, a lot of different reflection amplification vectors uh, were used uh, by this attacker um, over time uh, with different levels of frequency. They kept coming back to DNS reflection amplification in combination with something else, at least when they launched their initial um, demonstration DDoS attack. And during the, the pandemic, when we look across the entire DDoS uh, attack landscape, not just the LBA campaign, we see a lot of familiar vertical industries targeted like wireless and wireline broadband access providers. Uh, for example, we saw a lot of uh, computer and electronic equipment uh, vendors attacked, um, uh, schools, middle schools high schools and universities attacked. And we also saw a, a considerable upswing or increase in attacks against internet publishing and broadcasting uh, verticals as well. We've always seen attacks against those industries, but it really seemed to um, grow considerably during the pandemic. So <clears throat> we mentioned earlier that uh, we observed four or actually three and a half uh, new DDoS vectors used by attackers during the pandemic. Uh, the first one was RDP over UDP. This is Microsoft's uh, remote desktop protocol. We saw that one leverage for reflection amplification. Excuse me, we saw this one used in attacks uh, with other vectors uh, that combined uh, of over 750 gigabits per second. We saw Plex Media Server, SSDP, leverage this reflection amplification vector. DTLS, um, a lot, uh, which is the UDP version of TLS, leverage this reflection amplification vector. And then we saw the attackers try to exploit a reflection amplification vector using the Jenkins software distribution system, but apparently, uh, uh, the Jenkins servers that they tried to use were so brattle, uh, br brittle and fragile and non-scalable that when they tried to leverage these Jenkins servers to launch a DDoS attack, the uh, servers they were trying to use as reflectors amplifiers actually fell over, and so the attack fizzled. Um, when we take a look at the top DDoS vectors observed across the world during the pandemic for, I think, the third year in a row now, DNS reflection amplification was the single most common uh, DDoS attack vector. Uh, for many, many years, send flooding was the most common vector we would see. Um, and then uh, DNS reflection amplification rose to number one, and then send flooding was uh, number two. But uh, during the pandemic, we saw a shift uh, towards TCP ACK flooding attacks. And so that puts send flooding uh, in third place. And in terms of multi-vector attacks, we saw uh, some DDoS attacks with up to 25 different attack vectors being used by the attackers uh, over the course of the attack. And so um, if you look at the different, uh, different uh, uh, striations there in the chart, we saw in some cases up to a 312% growth in the number of simultaneous attack vectors uh, that were used. So when we break attacks down by region, uh, we saw uh, increases across the board in Latin and South America. We saw a 50% increase uh, in the frequency of DDoS attacks. Now that was accompanied by a decrease in the time duration of the attacks. And the reason for this is the switch over uh, by attackers in Latin and South America to these commercial DDoS for hire services. And those DDoS for hire services typically sell access to their DDoS attack infrastructure in blocks of five minute increments. And so uh, we saw those decreases in a lot of regions and that was especially prevalent in Latin and South America.
And if we take a look um, at uh, what we call the DDoS attack coefficient, we basically looked through the entire year to see what minute of what hour of what day did we see the highest simultaneous DDoS attack bandwidth at one time. And so if we look at Latin America, the standout was actually in December when we saw a single one minute period where there were 759 gigabits per second of DDoS attacks taking place across Latin and South America. And when we look at the throughput um, uh, in Latin and South America, uh, I believe that uh, September, no, actually it was December again, with 211 million packets per second of DDoS attacks taking place simultaneously within the same one minute period across the region. And so we've seen this growth um, in the DDoS, simultaneous DDoS attack vectors, uh, as I noted. And in Latin and South America in particular, the DDoS attack that we observed with the largest number of DDoS uh, vectors used simultaneously was 23 different uh, attack, attack vectors used in a single multi-vector DDoS attack. Um, and of course, if we take a look um, at these multi-vector attacks, we can break them down uh, by country. We see that Brazil, um, Mexico, Colombia, uh, Peru, and Chile are all represented um, in the top 20 um, um, in, in 2017. And as we watch this move over time across the last few years, we see that Latin and South America are still represented in the top uh, 20 or so uh, countries around the world for multi-vector DDoS attacks. And in particular, once we get into the pandemic period again, we see once again, Brazil, Colombia, uh, Chile, uh, Mexico, and Peru uh, with the largest number of simultaneous uh, vectors used in a single multi-vector attack taking place in Brazil uh, at 22 vectors in one attack. And if we take it, we also in the threat report have uh, breakdowns for 19 different countries, including countries uh, in Latin and South America. You see uh, we have the Brazil page highlighted here, for example. And so a lot of these DDoS attacks are, of course, launched by IoT botnets. These are routers or um, DVRs or video cameras that are internet connected, either directly or via static NAT translation. They have vulnerabilities and the attackers compromise them, bring them into a botnet and use them uh, to launch DDoS attacks. And so Mirai and Mirai variants are the most common uh, IoT botnet that we see. We do see others. Uh, and of course, over time, you see the number of Mirai nodes growing. During the pandemic, we got to 2.3 million uh, Mirai nodes in different botnets. This is not one botnet, but different botnets that are using different variants of Mirai uh, to compromise and leverage different types of these IoT devices to launch DDoS attacks. And of course, the number one way that these devices are compromised is not through vulnerabilities, although that uh, does sometimes happen happen is because they have default credentials that were configured by the manufacturer and the administrative login, whether it's via the web or telnet or SSH, is exposed to the internet. And so these are the, the um, primary sets of, of credentials that we saw as the bots tried to propagate uh, around the world. These are the credentials that we saw them using to try to recruit other IoT devices into the botnet. And so just looking at telnet alone, uh, we can see uh, a lot of activity popping up in different regions uh, around the world here over time where we see these brute force attacks taking place. And so, again, when you see an IoT device get compromised, pulled into a botnet like Mirai, oftentimes that device will start scanning and looking for other devices to recruit into the botnet. And so uh, we're taking a look here during the pandemic, and we saw uh, a botnet based on HickVision, uh, network-connected DVRs and uh, CCTV cameras. All, all of a sudden, uh, apparently, the attackers discovered some vulnerabilities in these devices, or in this case, actually not vulnerabilities, but they discovered administrative credentials. And so they started scanning for these HickVision IoT devices, and they were able to uh, 
compromise a number of them. And so you see this peak here uh, between September uh, and November. We're basically watching a new botnet being born uh, during this time. And of course, we have uh, the threat report available for free for download. Uh, and you can also go to horizon.nescout.com and all of the uh, DDoS attacks that we see, we're seeing something like 33,000 DDoS attacks a day. You can actually go and look at those DDoS attacks and you can see packets per second, bits per second, DDoS vectors. You can see country and regional breakdowns. Um, they're not real time. I think they're delayed by about one hour, but these are the statistics uh, on which we base this report. And so um, that is what I had for my presentation. Um, if you have questions or comments, uh, please go ahead. Thank you for your presentation. Now we'll give the audience some time to send the questions through the Q&A. We have a, a question here in the room in the auditorium. If there are no in the Q&A panel, then we'll start with that. Hi, Hello, go ahead. Uh, I was wondering about the, the incredible number you, you spoke before about the total bandwidth used in a single one minute attack. I was wondering if you knew the, the amount of participants in said attack, and in that case, if we can uh, estimate the, the bandwidth use per attacker. Okay, that's an excellent question. Thank you for that. I don't know how many nodes were used, but that would that would that the the highest bandwidth attacks that we see are reflection amplification attacks, where the attackers are leveraging vulnerable and abusable servers and services around the world. Some of them, many of them, running actually on IoT devices like DNS forwarders and things like this that are open and exposed to the internet. And so, um, one interesting thing that we see with the with all reflection amplification attacks is that most of these attacks only use a relatively small proportion of the available reflectors amplifiers of a given type. So for example, there's something like 8 million DNS reflectors amplifiers around the world right now that the attackers can use. But in most of these attacks, we see that a smaller number um, of the nodes are used, 10,000, 20,000, 50,000, sometimes 100,000 in a given attack. And the reason for this is that most of these attacks are launched by DDoS for higher services. They don't do their own internet scanning to identify the reflectors amplifiers. Uh, so the bad guys who do the scanning they they talk to each other in the the digital underground and they actually will trade lists of reflectors amplifiers to use uh, in exchange for like time on the DDoS for higher service to launch attacks. So these scanning lists are a form of currency in the digital underground. And another reason also is the DDoS for higher service may have multiple criminal customers who are launching attacks against different targets at the same time. And so they want to conserve the resources. And so they will have uh, bad guy A uh, targeting uh, target number one will use these 10,000 reflectors amplifiers, DNS reflectors amplifiers fires and bad guy B who is targeting target number two will use another 10,000 reflectors amplifiers so it's also a form of resource conservation so um, we typically uh, 10,000 20,000 is, is very common in reflection amplification attacks um, I don't have the precise answer for that number of simultaneous uh, attacks but something around that number per attack so hopefully that, that at least gives you some some uh, useful data Thank you very much, Ron. Again, excellent presentation. Very kind. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Carlos. Vuelvo contigo Thank para you, Carlos. I'm back to you to see if there are any questions in the Q&A panel. Yes, we have a question from the Q&A window. Uh, Oscar Javier Cárdenas is uh, asking, what are the common or the most common ways to attack IoT devices and how are these okay. attacks increasing in Latin America? So the most common way is, again, that the manufacturers of these devices unfortunately put default administrative credentials into device, like, you know, admin as the user account for the administrator of like the home router or the, the digital 
uh, can't digital DVR and admin as the password. And unfortunately, besides doing that, they expose the web uh, administration interface of the IoT device or the DVR or the CCTV camera to the internet by default. And the bad guys are constantly scanning and looking, the, and they'll just try brute force passwords over and over again. And these devices don't have any kind of timeout, whether it is uh, uh, for retry attempts, whether it is the the web administrative interface or it's a telnet administrative interface and a shocking number of devices have telnet exposed, or whether it's an SSH interface. And and, and so you can they, they can just automate uh, the process of trying these common passwords some of the more advanced um, uh, threat act actually uh, get some of these devices and they'll disassemble the code and they'll extract um, the, the credentials that way and then popularize them. And again, they trade these lists of credentials with one another. So that's the most popular way. Now, there are other ways. For example, if there is a well-known vulnerability, um, as we've seen recently with uh, some Microtech routers, they actually had a, a remote compromise vulnerability in 2018. Microtech very promptly issued a pass and they told all their customers around the world to upgrade. But unfortunately, Unfortunately, many of them did not. And so we've seen uh, at least two different botnets come up that are leveraging unpatched Microtech routers to launch um, DDoS attacks. So hopefully that answers the question. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Roland. I do have a question myself, and it's uh, sure. regarding a comment you made earlier about that the most common way to generate DDoS traffic is using amplification attacks, which is something that's a trend that has been going on for some years. I wonder whether yes. you see a trend in new protocols being abused. Historically, DNS was the most abused, then it came NTP, and I wonder whether there are others. <laughs> So, so uh, this year alone, I can tell you that we've seen, I believe, if I recall correctly, seven different vectors. And that's one of the things that I do um, at Nescout is I work on a team where we research new DDoS attack vectors and how to defend against them and also act as fourth tier escalation. So we actually are, we're a very much hands-on group helping operators mitigate these CDOS attacks. And so uh, we've seen um, uh, the innovation of the attackers with these, these I think, seven different vectors, six or seven different vectors this year. Uh, also, we've seen in the last six months an uptick in packet flooding attacks, direct path packet flooding attacks that are, in many cases, they're not spoofed because a lot of the IoT bots cannot spoof. They can't get sufficient privilege escalation to spoof or they are on like broadband access networks that have source address validation enabled so they can't spoof but they will launch these um, small packet high PPS or high throughput um, UDP flooding. And so we see a lot of that. Another thing we've seen in the last, I would say three or four months is a new rise in HTTP and HTTPS uh, direct uh, path. Uh, again, application layer attacks that are launched by these um, IoT botnets. And some of the IoT botnets also have SOX proxies on them. And so either they're used to launch the attacks directly or they rent access to these proxies out to criminals who then have their own attack generation infrastructure and they they use the botnet to forward the HTTP application layer attacks through the proxy. And so we're seeing a lot of that as well now.